Keto and crime, keto and crime. We uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime. Now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, Tracy here from Keto and Crime. Thank you so much to every single one of my patrons and channel members. You make this possible. And uh, you're one of the reasons I do this. And I thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I haven't said it before, thank you. I'll sing it. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with me and letting me geek out, not making fun of me like a lot of other people do because I like weird stuff about crime and dark history. Re, re. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Keto and Crime. Today, I've got another mad medical experiment to talk to you about. And this one, barring maybe the Tuskegee experiment, this one was the most cringeworthy, the most disturbing experiment that I've ever read about listened to a podcast about, uh, researched. It's just mind-blowing, and if you have a weak stomach, if you have anger issues, I highly recommend you just don't watch this particular video. But uh, anyway, today we've got John Money, Dr. John Money, and his Nature versus Nurture experiment on two young, innocent Canadian boys. Let's dive into it, shall we? A big thank you to all my patrons, channel members, and my subscribers. Could not do this without you. You are eternally loved, and I appreciate it. And with that being said, let's dive into this dumpster fire. John Money was born in Morinsville, New Zealand, to a family of English and Welsh descent. He attended Hutt Valley High School and initially studied psychology and psychotherapy at Victoria University of Wellington. I'm sure my subscribers in New Zealand can fill me in much more on the uh, this location and this school, but uh, he did end up graduating with a doubles master's degree in psychology and education in 1944 and joined the faculty, psychology faculty at the University of Otago and and Forgive me if I butcher this name, my, my wonderful New Zealand friends. Duoden. Um, at Duoden, he, or Otago University, he became infamous for committing a renowned New Zealand author, Janet Frame, to a psychiatric ward for uh, several years because she attended some of his psychology classes as part of her education degree and wrote an essay where she mentioned fleeting thoughts, according to her, fleeting thoughts of, of taking the big ticket out because of YouTube. I can't say the word, but you know what I'm talking about. She, you know, was going to, fleeting thoughts of Kevorkian and herself. But um, for the most part, I, maybe this is a neutral thing that he did because maybe as a as a psychology professional, I, I'm pretty sure there is a you know ethics thing that says you have to help people that talk about those things. But also, it was an essay, and I read parts of it, and in the context, I don't think it was worthy of her being committed. Uh, I think she was just talking about having had those thoughts. Um, at a one point in my life, I've had those thoughts. Uh, worked it all out. But, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe it's neutral. But I just felt I needed to mention it. Um, basically, uh, and she wrote about it. In her own autobiography, uh, she referred to him as the as a man named John Forrest and basically vented all over him. You go, girl. Uh, in 40, 1947, Dr. Money, he was 26 years old. He immigrated to the United States to study 
uh, psychiatry at the Psychiatry Institute of the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he did not graduate there, but he did eventually transfer to Harvard University, of course, graduating there with a doctorate in psychology in 1952. Uh, he was married briefly, uh, that quickly ended, but they had no children, thank the heavens. Basically, many of his proposals, many things that he worked on while studying for his dissertation, writing his dissertation, uh, anything that he was related to, he was fascinated with gender roles, gender identity. In fact, he coined those terms and also uh, things about sexual preference, sexual orientation, and he also uh, worked off of the premise of what we know as a love map. Uh, he considered himself a sexologist because, of course, he did. And basically, um, it's a map that shows different tendencies toward preferences. Think of it as a huge, you know, pie chart of your preferences and everybody falls into a sector or across sectors. So it's exactly what it sounds like, a love map. Anyway. Uh, he also uh, popularized the uh, definition paraphilia, which does appear in the DSM-3, which is the huge manual that in which mental health professionals used to diagnose people. Uh, it would replace the word perversion that was used up until about the 1960s, 1970s. And he coined the phrases gender identity, gender role, sexual orientation, instead of sexual preferences because according to his studies sexual preference is more of an orientation in that you don't have it's not a conscious choice now being a member of the premium pack myself uh having been more uh always been more attracted to females than males um i can attest that for me it was not a conscious choice it just is who i am now, I believe that there can be some nurture in on that too, which we will find out a little bit about that. Uh, for some people, I think there's probably a percentage of, now I'm not talking about gender, I'm not talking about gender ideology here. I'm talking about sexual orientation outside of heterosexuality. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, the big three in the premium pack, the original three. Um, I think there is a percentage of those people. So 10%, roughly 10% of the population and is falls into those categories. And you see that in nature too, with different species. But uh, I think of that 10%, there is a percentage that perhaps something happened in their, their past that kind of made them cleave more to same sex rather than opposite sex. Now you can come at me with all this hate. I've observed this. I've dated people that have fallen into this percentage. And it is very definitely that perhaps they would have been heterosexual or more inclined to be heterosexual if those things had not happened. But I think it's a minority. I definitely think it's a small percentage, but there is a percentage. So for a small percentage, it might be more of a preference, but for the vast majority, it's definitely an orientation. I want to preface my opinions on that before we get into this, and I'm probably going to get hate from all sides. Don't hate me. I love you all. Just my opinion. Take it with the biggest salt shaker you've ever had. You also have to realize that I come from a very religious fundamentalist family, and there's still members of my family that refer to me as, Tracy's just that way. They know. <laughs> but in, anyway, back to John Money. So he coined all of those things. And I'm not saying, you know, the wor most broken clock is right sometimes twice a day. So you, you got to give credit where credit's due. Um, he was uh, eventually hired as a, profesh uh, a professor of <laughs> <laughs> pediatrics and medical psychology at John Hopkins. Uh, University. He held that role from 1951 until his death. Um, he co-authored several books and several papers on gender role uh, and how uh, 
effeminacy and prepubescent boys affects outcomes. Mainly what you have to take away from John Money's early writings is that he believed that things like gender roles, specifically gender identity, and gender roles, which gender identity is your identification of the gender that you feel that you are. So it's basically the basis of all the gender identity uh, theory that we have today is not necessarily tied to your biological sex, if that makes if that makes sense. So he's saying that gender identity can be different from what you are biologically. And gender role are predefined things that society has placed on certain genders. You know, uh, think of traditional 1950s, man goes off to work, earns the money, mom stays home with the kids. You know, there are female jobs, teaching, nursing, traditional female jobs, and then there are being an engineer, a soldier. Those are more male-oriented professions, and those, if you believe in traditional gender roles, you would never deviate from that. But he said that those things can be affected by nurture as much as nature, that one's gender identity is not necessarily tied to their sexual orientation. I believe that. To, to a point, I think that there is something called gender dysphoria, which is an actual diagnosed condition. Uh, it is a small percentage of people, but those people literally have, they cannot tie themselves to their biological sex as far as it being their gender. And those people, the ones that I think are truly gender dysphoric, should be able to get all the health care and gender affirming treatments that they need once they reach the age of adulthood and it is absolutely diagnosed that this is their condition and it needs to be treated. Uh, I go back to my belief that young children uh, cannot decide that for themselves because they still wet the bed and believe in Santa Claus. So there you go. Uh, John Money died in uh, <clears throat> In uh, 2006, one day before his 85th birthday in Maryland, and uh, was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2002. So he devoted his entire life to the study of uh, gender and the sexual orientation. And now for the reason that we are here, the most perverse experiment ever done. Let's talk about it. The case of the Reamer twins, Bruce and Brian, and this, they were born early 1966. Um, they were circumcised, as is the tradition. They were Canadian, and a botched circumcision left uh, eight-month-old Bruce Reamer without a penis. I don't even want to think about that. But uh, at the time, Dr. Money was one of the most respected sexologists and child psychologists, pediatric psychologists around, and he convinced Reamer's parents that the best thing for Bruce, instead of having to go through life not having a penis, you know, uh, having to get a prosthetic penis, was to basically change him from a boy to a girl. And this was a way for him to test his theory that gender identity and sex is not linked uh, directly. And so uh, the parents, because he was so well respected, uh, bought it and he underwent uh, at almost age two a uh, procedure which removed his testicles and he was started on hormone replacement therapy and raised under the name Brenda as a female, along with his twin brother, Brian. Um, however, it didn't uh, work out so good because uh, from all accounts, uh, Brenda was a hefty, hefty tomboy. She loved all the things that her brother did. She re she never considered herself a girl. She has said this as an adult. She, he never considered himself a girl. And I say he because he later had everything reversed. But basically, um, 
He liked everything that his brother did. Uh, he was definitely a boy, definitely cleaved to what he was biologically born as far as gender identity and uh, did not take well to being made into a girl. Now, um, the parents continued to take uh, the boys to visit uh, Dr. Money. And according to the boys, uh, many of these uh, visits included uh, them being forced to um, pre do uh, sex acts on each other. I told you this was disturbing. Uh, and basically, Money lied about the results. He saw what was happening. He saw that Brenda was not a girl, and he lied about it. And eventually, um, at age 14, under duress of almost having a psychotic breakdown because he literally Brenda thought she was trans because she had been told that she was born a girl she's going through all these weird experiments by Dr. John Money and but she felt like a boy finally her parents at age 14 told her the truth and guess what she said nope I'm a boy I was born a boy I am a boy I mean I'm paraphrasing and he began to call himself David and underwent um, another sex reassignment surgery to change him back to a boy, including a prosthetic a penis. So basically, this all came to light uh, in 1997 when he, uh, when David went and spoke to Milton Diamond, an academic sexologist. Um, and basically, it all came out in an article in Rolling Stone magazine and, and also a biography that, autobiography, excuse me, biography that someone else wrote of him, which came out in the year 2000, the boy who was raised as a girl. Uh, his brother, this also affected Brian, uh, he overdosed on antidepressant 2002 and David who I will put a Oprah interview that was actually done with him shortly before his death here he committed suicide with a shotgun uh, not long after his brother yeah devastating the lives of just about everybody involved this is David who has remained anonymous until now, uh, only known in the medical journals as John Joan. And this is Janet Reimer, David's mother, who made the agonizing decision to change the sex of her son and to raise him as a girl. And what you all at home didn't see during the taping of that piece, um, we could tell Janet you were, you know, moved and probably disturbed by. <sighs> what you're saying. And David, you, you comfort her. So, she's hurting right now. Uh, mothers are all over the world are all alike. There's guilt. Uh, it's darned if you do and darned if you don't. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what things that were done were done out of compassion, out of love for your child. Mm -hmm. and, and how can I hate my mother for that? Mm -hmm. Did you think he would hate you? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Did you hate yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you talk on the tape about the day you first put the dress on. Did you have agonizing feelings about it even when the doctor, or were you of that generation or kind of person when the doctor said this would be best? Did you all believe that it would be best? Yes, I had complete faith in the doctor. Mm -hmm. I believed it would be best. But when he started to rip it off, I started to have doubts mm -hmm. and during the whole journey of trying to create a feminine being there were doubts along the way but I couldn't afford to contemplate them because I couldn't afford to be wrong I couldn't have faced the alternative and the alternative being what that you'd made this horrible mistake yes because then what could you do right since you, since your earliest memories, you never felt like you were a boy, a girl. I never quite fit in. Uh, uh, well, the girls would do their things with their Barbies and things like that, and that wouldn't interest me. Mm -hmm. And uh, things such as 
trucks and uh, building forts and, uh, you know, getting to the odd fist fight and mm-hmm. climbing trees. That's the kind of stuff that I like, but it was unacceptable. So I'd never... As a girl. As, as a girl, I had no place to, to fit in. So what would you say? So... Uh, Money blamed the right wing, saying that the expose turned everyone against him, and it was media bias that the results were actually promising, even though they both committed suicide. Um, But many sexologists in the field did criticize Money and said that this experiment should never have taken place, and I agree with them. Uh, In addition, Money has also been controversial in that uh, he has argued that uh, pedophilia is a legitimate uh, sexual orientation and that it can be about love, not just sex, and that you are also born that way. So, that's John Money. Uh, He's dead. And for the first time in a long time, I'm going to say good. Good. And uh, basically, uh, that's the story. I don't think he was ever uh, sued or had to pay any retribution for what he did to the Reamer twins. But, uh, yeah. It's Sean Money. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful what ideology you jump on and... uh, Don't get your information from me, from anyone else on YouTube or TikTok or Facebook. Talk to your doctor. Talk to your parents, please. And with that being said, I'll be back soon with more true crime cases and weird dark history. And until next time, keto and crime. I'm going to go get some eye bleach now. Ah!